the final words of Moses, the final ha-moving words of Moshe before he's about to die, he's pouring out all of these words. And this portion tonight, Shof Team, it's called Shof Team, it's like S H O F T I M, the plural of Shafat, which means judge and portion called judges, judges. But if we just do a quick overview of the whole portion, it, it starts off in chapter 16, verse 18, but it finishes off in chapter 21, verse 9. And if you please always read this before you get here, or the Sabbath, all day tomorrow, always try and cover the Torah portion yourself. It only takes half an hour. An hour, if you... Or all week, if you may. <laughs> <laughs> But what I mean is, is yeah. read it yourself, and then you'll see what's going on, yeah. and which I'm going to try and focus mainly on tonight. Is you get this first part, which is about judges, yeah. judges. The second part in chapter 80, excuse me, is about kings. It's a the Torah's requirements for kings, and we'll look at that in detail. Then it goes into the prophet, prophet. I mean, one of the most important scriptures in the Torah. We read it tonight, Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15. If you've done the Gospels with us, you know that scripture. Because in the Gospels, we're always mentioning that scripture. Because it's the scripture where Moshe says, God is going to raise up a prophet like me from your brethren. You better listen to him. <laughs> Whoever doesn't listen to the prophet that's going to come like me, that's it. You've got no chance. This is what Moses prophesies about tonight, and it's all Yeshua. So you got the judge, you got the king, you got the prophet, then you get a message about the priesthood, and then it all finishes off with a message about when you go out to war. So if you put all of that together tonight, you're going to get a message about the judge, who is the king, who is the prophet, who is the priest, and who is coming to make war. And that's what we'll cover tonight. You know, so I don't know where, how much detail we get into because I want to do that overview of who this is about. So let's start off to the first, I'll just read the first few verses of chapter 16, verse 18, and we'll just read down to chapter 17. So it starts off, you shall appoint judges, shelf team, shelf team, you shall appoint judges and officers, so this is like the magistrates and the police. The fellas who will enforce the law and the fellas, the judges who will decide upon how the law is to be administered. Yeah, and then, yeah, and then the officers to implement yeah. in all your gates. So, so before, before we even get going, going, I just want to open that word up a bit. It's a strange word. You've got to put office, judges and officers in all your gates. And this is what happened was that the gates of the city was where they would sit. And that's where judge justice will be administered. That's what it's saying. But it's a peculiar word when you look at it. The word for gates is sha'a, sha'a. And the root of that is also sha'a. And you know, you see it once in the Bible. And you will know it. It's Proverbs 23, verse 7. As soon as I say that, you know what that is, don't you? Proverbs 23, verse 7 says, As a man thinks in his heart, thinks, so is he. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. It's like them fellas who were like that. Oh, we were like grasshoppers. All the giants, some of you, and it's like, exactly. If you think you're a grasshopper, that's what you'll be like. Yeah. You know, that's being taken to extremes with power of positive thinking. I'm not trying to get into all that psychology. But the word of God says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Which is a message to us. We need to think right. Think righteously. Think of ourselves, how he looks at us, which is far better than we think of ourselves. He thinks we're great. He loves us. He see, said to me in the Torah of the week, I see no sin in Israel. I have observed no iniquity in Yaakov. Because he sees us through the Messiah. So we need to really, this is like an Andrew Womack message. Is the yeah. Think, it is not any it is. Think this how you think is going to dictate how you will be. If you think you're a load of rubbish, you'll be a load of rubbish, which is you're always on my case. Stop talking like that about yourself. You know, well, I've never probably had the nose on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So what I'm saying this is because the only 
time that this word is used other than gates is for the word thinks. So you can see now, can't you, that your mind is a gate. Your mind's a gate. Yeah. So what's what comes in? And that's, you know, this is talking about sets of fellas that are going to sit in the gates and judge, but it's also saying, what's your own gate? And what's what comes in and out of that gate? Judge righteously. Set your mind, and one of my favourite scriptures, set your mind on things above. It says the full scripture, Colossians 3, if you have died then, and thou art risen with the Messiah, set your mind on things above where he is seated at the right hand of God. Start thinking that of yourself, that you really are seated in heavenly places in the Messiah. Ah, that's what Paul's saying, set your minds on things above. What, a, what an advice that is. Yeah. And imagine if we could start to do that and start to have those thoughts in our minds. This is the only way. It's the only way. Meditate on this day and night, Joshua, and then you will have good success and then you will prosper in all you do. You know, set your minds on things above. This is what this is about. So you've got to be the judge of your own gate. Fair enough. So I mean, that's a bit of an aside. Just to, that's just the great way. So appoint judges and officers in all your gates, which Yahweh your Elohim gives you according to your tribes, and they shall judge. This is it. They shall judge the people with just, or in Hebrew, zadi, righteous. This is the word. This is this the word. Righteous judgments. This is the way I want you to remember that this judge, this is all talking about Shire. The judge must judge the people with righteous judgment. Verse 19. You shall not pervert justice. You shall not show partiality, nor take a bribe. For a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and twists the words of the righteous. This is what happened at Yeshua's death, wasn't it? Sorry, at his resurrection. <laughs> they bribed the guards, didn't To say all that. Uh, they nicked him when we were asleep. <laughs> it's like they bribed the guards. You know, it's do not bribe. Verse 20. You shall follow what is, it says in my version, altogether just. In the Hebrew, it's that double emphasis. It says, you shall follow zadi, zadi, righteousness, righteousness. It's emphasizing this word. You shall follow righteousness, righteousness, that you may live and inherit the land which Yahovah, your Elohim, has given you. So let me just stop there and read a couple of Psalms, maybe, or one at the most, at, sorry, at least, to bring this together. You know this Psalm because it's one of the Shabbat Psalms, Psalm 96, we're going to read. Psalm 96, and you know this one. We read this a lot, and we were talking about it last night, and just to restate what we say here quite a bit, that the Sabbath, the Sabbath day, is a shadow picture. What of? What of? Things to, things to come. Thank you very much. That's what Paul says in Colossians chapter 2. He says that these shadows, these Sabbaths, they are shadows of things to come. He's writing this after the death and the resurrection and the ascension of Yeshua and Paul's still saying that the Sabbaths and these feasts are shadows of things to come and the Sabbath is the first on the list of feasts isn't it? In Leviticus 23 it says these are my feasts not Israel's feasts not the Jews feasts my feasts God says these are my feasts which you shall proclaim that's why I'm saying let's get evangelistic about this let's tell people Tabernacles is coming soon. Do you want to come to our Tabernacles celebration? Because Yeshua will be here. <laughs> He'll be here for his birthday party. So, uh, man. So, what I'm saying is, is let's get evangelistic about this. And the Sabbath, top of the list in Leviticus 23, is a picture of things to come. And it's a picture of the millennium reign, the millennial reign of the Messiah. The creation has been a creation, or mankind has been, you know, the narrative started in Genesis 6,000 years ago. And it says in Peter quite clearly when he is describing the coming of Yeshua, 
he, he sees it necessary to inform us in Second Peter chapter three. Brethren, you've got to get on this. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years. A thousand years is like a day. And this is explaining the seven days of creation in Genesis one and two. That the six the six days of creation with the last six thousand years. And we are on the eve of or the very verge of the start of the seventh day, which is the Sabbath. It's what it's pointing to. It's a thousand year reign of the Messiah on earth, peace on earth, the government on his shoulders, his kingdom come for a thousand years on this earth. That's what the Sabbath's a picture of. So let's read one of the Sabbath Psalms. Let's read Psalm 96. This is a Sabbath Psalm. Psalms 90 to 99 are the Sabbath Psalms. Ten wonderful Psalms you can read on the Sabbath. Now when you start to realise what they're about, you'll want to start reading them more. Because it's an end time message, this. Psalm 96. Look how it starts. Psalm 96. 96. Look how it starts. Oh, sing to Yah a new song. Well, when you see that, you should immediately turn to Revelation chapter 5. Because Revelation chapter 5 is the words of the new song. <laughs> it tells you the elders are all there with harps. When you say harps, they're all end time instruments. It's always harps in the book of Revelation. When you say, get your harp out, it's talking end time here. So, singing a new song is Revelation 5 when the elders have got the harps out and they are singing the words of the new song and it's all to Yeshua. Worthy are you, for you have redeemed us by your blood and you have made us into kings and priests unto our God. And at the end of it, it's saying, all the creatures of the earth and all those under the earth and in the earth and all them ones in the sea, let them sing, let them shout. And this is what this psalm's all about. Psalm 96, oh sing to Yahovah a new song, sing to Yahovah all the earth, proclaim the good news, the gospel of, uh, of Yeshua, isn't it, in Hebrew, salvation is he in Hebrew, it's Yeshua, it's saying proclaim the gospel of Yeshua from day to day, let's start to declare his glory among the nations, declare his wonders among the peoples, Start telling everyone he's great. For Yahovah is great. Yeah, that's all, yeah. And greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods and the people are idols. But Yahovah made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Give to Yah, O oh families of the peoples. Give to Yah glory and strength. This is all what you see in Revelation, isn't it? All of this. Ascribe and glory and strength. Give to Yahovah the glory due his name. Bring an offering. Well, we know that from Romans 12, don't we? And Leviticus, when we do it all, you know who the offering is, don't you? You, <laughs> you offer yourselves up as living sacrifices. You're the priest and the offering of your life. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship Yahovah in the beauty of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth, and I fear the trembling. Say among the nations, Yahovah reigns. We sing it tonight. The world also is firmly established. It shall not be moved. Yeah. Look at this verse. He shall judge. That's what we're talking about, isn't it? Sh show team. Judge. And how do you got to judge? Righteously. Well, he shall judge the peoples righteously. Let the heavens rejoice. Let the earth be glad. Let the sea roar. Revelation 5. And all its fullness. Let the field be joyful. And all that in it. Then all the trees of the woods will rejoice before Yahovah. Why? Because he is coming. He is coming before to judge the earth. He shall judge the world with righteousness. And the peoples with equity. Or with truth. You could read Psalm 98. It's like a, a copy of that. It's like the same thing, so I won't bother reading it. The message here is, he shall judge the people righteously. He is coming. See what I mean about the Sabbath Psalms are an end time message. 
they are a herald of the seventh day that millennial reign is upon us and that's what it's saying it's a sabbath psalm on the sabbath you went to get into all this and go oh we set we keep the creator's sabbath because he told us we to. Set, we keep. and he said remember certain things and he's given us it to synchronize us with his time it really is i've never been so synchronized with god on a time like i am nowadays with the feasts and i used to have to watch someone to get me thinking that he's coming soon not like not anymore i can't stop thinking he's coming soon it's like he is and the feasts and the sabbaths help it's his way the creator has made to engage us and not to engage our flesh but to engage our spirits and to touch our hearts and to change our way of thinking by his time schedule the sabbath is so important it is so important we don't worship the sabbath but we worship the lord of the sabbath so while i was saying all this just to cut to the chase let's go to revelation wow revelation makes it all come together revelation makes it all come together revelation 19 19 11. Nice. thank you john you're all right yeah you're on you are on Revelation chapter 19 verse 11. If you read, if you read this yourself, please. Revelation 19. I'll just read one verse from it, which will make sense now. Revelation 19 verse uh, verse. I was going to read this verse, verse 7 verse. Let us be glad and rejoice and give Him glory. Yeah. So we're about body color. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and His wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen that's the reason i'm reading this fine linen clean and bright for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints that's very clear isn't it the righteous linen the white linen is the righteous acts of the saints it's what the saints do right <laughs> you know it's what the saints do right and righteousness is what god said is righteous it's his Tore. that's what it is and that's the righteous acts i mean be sharing the art a lot with people that spend time with saying i'm really crying out here that this group will become more than a bible study and will become a real fellowship and that we will start to do the works that we're called to do the works that we are called to do which are you know looking after each other which i'm going out your way for people and when someone ate the foot get in touch and say can i do the shopping for you and can i give you a lift and could have come and fix your drain pipe <laughs> you know and just things that we can do to help each other look after the widows look after the orphans look after the poor you know and i want this to be a group where we know that this is getting done we know the prisoners are getting visited george has got a ministry to go to the visit the prisoner so bless them and pray for them in this and we need to know what others are doing and we know people do good works here but this is what you want to be wearing your bridal gear down to the righteous acts of the saints from what I can read. So that's the fine and we read about it now. Back on to where we're going here. Verse 11, as John said. This is it. Come on, see this. Open our eyes, Lord, please. Open our eyes, like we read about last week in portion. Help us to behold. We don't walk by sight, we walk by faith. But open the eyes of our understanding, Lord. Oh, I want to see the glorious things in your word. So let this just be words on a page. Write it on our hearts and minds, Lord, and help us to see this is all about to happen. This is going to happen soon. Verse 11 of Revelation 19. Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called Faithful and True. Look, and what's he do? In righteousness, he judges. That's what we're reading about, aren't we? You've got to put judges there who will judge righteously. You know, we know that most of the commands, Israel just broke them. It's always pointing to the Messiah. That's who it's really written about. And that's what he's going to fulfill. You know what he said? Don't think I've come to do away with the Torah. Because <laughs> if he's come to do away with the Torah, he won't be able to fulfill this bit. Because this is the Torah and the prophets, what this is saying. This is what Isaiah has been saying and Zechariah has been saying. So you don't think I've come to do away with them. They will come to do away with them and won't be coming back. Because they're calling for me to come back. 
In righteousness, he judges. And what else does he do? Makes war. That's the end of this portion. The instruction is for going to war. And I'll just run through them a bit quickly now, because we won't get that far. But they're very interesting. It says, I won't go even go there, I'll just summarise it quickly. But it says, if you're about to go to war, and if someone, if a, if a man's builds a house, but he hasn't gone to live in it yet, then let him go back and live in his house. Don't let him go to war in case he dies and doesn't get a chance to live in the house he's built. And the same goes if he's got a, a betrothed, if he's and betrothed the same goes to a woman, he... but they haven't become man and wife yet. So oh, let him go home. Let them go home and be man and wife. Don't let him go to war in case let them go he gets killed man. in battle and someone else oh, takes it. He gets Yeah, and if he's planted the vineyard and hasn't had a chance to have a lovely, fresh, beautiful and glass of wine. Else. Let him go home. Don't let him go to war. Let him go home and let him have a glass of wine. Because he's planted that vineyard and someone else might come and have it. These are the rules for going to war. And if, you, if you've got all that going on, don't go to war. And that's why when the first time you see him come, he didn't go, go to war. He said, I've come to war this time. He's coming back to go to war. Because now he's, he'll have built to To go to war. <laughs> and he'll have his bride then. And he'll have had his wine then. But he said, I'm not going to take this again. So I think he'll use in the kingdom. So when he's done all that, then he can come back for war. But look who he's coming back with. So he's coming back to judge righteously and make war. Verse 12, his eyes were like a flame of fire and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knows except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood and his name is called the Word of God and the armies of heaven. What are they clothed in? Finally. What's fine in The righteous acts of the saints, and he raised them, his bride. So he's coming back with his bride, this says. White and clean, follow him on white horses. <laughs> now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword. Now, that with it, he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and that of Almighty God, and he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So in just that bit, when you do this again yourself, the stats, you know this, the righteous judge, the judge that must judge righteously. So we've covered that bit, now we're gonna move on. You can see it clearly, can't you? The Psalms, the Sabbath Psalms, the millennial the Psalms are calling for it, for this judge to come. He is coming, he is coming to judge the people with righteousness. And there you go, the child of Luke, Revelation 19, you've got the full picture of it. He's coming on a white horse and the armies of heaven with their white horses and white linen. Don't you want to be in that? I mean, yeah. come on. Don't you want to be in that? It's not that far away. It's not that far away. Help us, Lord, please, in these days. That's why I prayed at the start. No matter where anyone's up to here, it's time to just turn back. It's time. It's, yeah, but it's time to come back. It's time to rededicate. It's who he is. He forgives sin. He forgives iniquity. He pardons transgressions, but he by no means will clear the guilty. The guilty are those who don't receive forgiveness. Just receive your forgiveness. Receive the cleansing and start all over again. A righteous man falls, but he gets up again. So just get up again if you fell. Amen. So let's go back to the story. That's great, Dominic. Revelation. So let's go. Oh, that's great. Shining white. Oh, I mean, let's see it. Let's really see it. I know that God can help us see this, you know. So help us, Lord. Amen. Yeah. Yeah, we'll just let that before. Go on. Go on. Uh -huh. Great. Okay. I see what you're saying. Okay. So we got that, haven't we? Yeshua. This is all about Yeshua. He is the judge. He will judge and he will judge. Judge totally righteously. It says, it said, if I don't take a bribe, it's a bribe away. Blind the eye and twist the words. So I'll just read one more scripture on that bit. Very important one. Isaiah 11. Very important scripture. 
I mean, even the Jews will, will say that this is a messianic passage. You know, this is a messianic passage, Isaiah 11. You know, it's very famous that there will come a root, a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch. We'll do all this when we do the Gospels, because that's that, you know this. Netze. Ah, Netze. That's why he shall be called a Nazarene, a Netze, because he is the branch. But so are we, because he said to me, I'm the vine now, now use the branches. <laughs> so a branch shall grow out of his roots, the spirit of Yah will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of Jehovah. His delight is in the fear of Yah, and he shall not judge Yah, he shall not judge by the sight of his eyes, what have we just read? A bribe. Something with the eyes, doesn't he? he? said, Nor decide by the hearing of his ears. This is exactly what the Torah wants, isn't it? A judge that will not be bribed yes. and will not judge by natural things, eyesight, by my right. ears. He will judge with righteousness. Verse 4 But with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. You can hear the Beatitudes and Arcadia, the same on the mount. Blessed are the poor, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Let's get back into the Torah now. Let's just gather ourselves and see where we're going in the Torah. Okay, oh, we've got to leave this. Bit. Let's get into the Kings bit. This is chapter 17. Chapter 17 is 14. The Kings part now. Got to read all this. Because we just read in Revelation who that is, didn't we? He's got a name on his own. He called it the King of Kings. So if there's anything one that this is right to, it's his shilly. And when we read it and we'll cross reference it, we'll all be thinking in a minute about some other king we all know, a king called Solomon. And we'll all be thinking, what was Solomon doing then? Because Solomon seems to break everything here. And this is just to juxtapose the two kings here. Because we all know the Messiah is going to be the son of David, don't we? And Solomon was the son of David. But Solomon wasn't the Messiah because he broke all this. Yeah. But Yeshua is the Messiah because he will do all of this. Verse 14. When you come to the land, chapter 17, verse 14. That's seven, yeah. When you come to the land which Jehovah your Elohim has given you, and you possess it and dwell in it, and say, I will set a king over me, like all the nations that are around me. This happens in 1 Samuel, doesn't it? 1 Samuel, we see this when this actually happens in Israel. Actually say this. Yeah. We want a king. We want a king. We want to be like all the other nations. They will have got kings. We want a king. So this is a wonderful prophecy from Moshe, Moses. You know hundreds of years before this but it's saying that you will say i will set a king over me verse 15 you shall surely set a king over you whom yahovah your elohim chooses whom one from among your brethren you shall set a king over you you may not set a foreigner over you who is not your brother this is why it's good news that yeshua when he died he put a sign over his head saying this is yeshua of nazareth the king of the jews great because He's got to be a king from one of our brethren. It'll say the same about the prophets when we get to chapter 18, that this prophet must be from one of your brethren, which totally scuppers the faith of Islam, because they say that that passage is talking about Muhammad. It's like a can't be. Well, we know it's not, but it clearly says it's got to be one of your brethren, not one of Ishmael's kids. It's got to be one of Israel's kids. Back to this king. So, he's got to be one of your brethren. Uh, you can't have a problem in verse 16. But he shall not multiply horses for himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt to multiply horses. For Yahweh has said to you, you shall not return that way again. Look, that's why I said, think about Solomon. Neither shall he multiply wives for himself, lest his heart turn away. Nor shall he greatly multiply silver and gold for himself. So let me just cross left and start with first kings. 
Sorry if I'm just going everywhere, but I want you to say First Kings. What? Yeah, First Kings. Well, I think First Kings 11. I just First Kings. I just read that this first. First Kings 10, verse 14. First Kings chapter 10, verse 14. The sword has just told us that he shall not multiply silver and gold for himself. Solomon. First Kings 10, 14. The weight of gold that came to Solomon yearly was guess how much? 666 talents of gold. That's strange, isn't it? Solomon used to get a yearly income or whatever of 666 talents of gold. Sure, that must have some relevance. Yeah. Well, yeah, but I think the 666 talents is, you know, oh, it's a lot like, but it's that number, the 666 thing, isn't it? Solomon is doing the exact opposite of what the Torah said. That's why I think it's a relevant number, 666. But he said, don't have any wives. Look at, look at chapter 11. First Kings chapter 11. But King Solomon loved many foreign women, as well as the daughters of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, and Hittites, which means terrorists, from the nations of whom Yahuwah had said to the children of Israel, you shall not enter my kingdom, nor they with you. Surely they will turn away your hearts after their gods. Solomon clung to these in love. And he has 700 wives. And 300 concubines. See all the sides of what about the mother in laws? See all the sides of what about the mother in laws? But maybe, what did the Torah say? He shall not multiply wives to himself. So I, I just think that means, you know, just have one wife. You know, it's only having like three and four wives. Solomon, seven hundred. I mean, where at that house? He's having a wedding every couple of weeks. Every couple of weeks, Solomon's having a wedding. You know, I know we like cheesecake and things like that on Bertie's, but Solomon. <laughs> Supposed to be like that. Wedding cake. There's a wedding cake. Seven hundred wives and three hundred concubines. <laughs> you know, it's just like this is the absolute. You can't get much further away from what God said in the Torah, can you? And this is King Solomon. But I think it's the juxtapose between the real, real, real spiritual son of David, Yeshua. And this fella, who was definitely the son of David, but not the Messiah, because thank God there may be many of us, but Yeshua's got one wife, one wife. <laughs> you know, there might be many of us, but we all count as one bride. You know, he has not going to have many wives. This is why the Torah is saying it. It's speaking to him, as you'll see even more. As chapter 17, uh, chapter 17. Oh, yeah, I love this verse. Verse 18. Oh. This verse, oh, verse 18, chapter 17. I'm going to ask you, I hope some of you will be on this. Who does this remind you of right now? Also, it shall be when he sits on the throne of his kingdom. Who does that remind you of, anyone, please? Sure. Yeah, and go a bit deeper. Glory. On sitting on the throne. Think about it, we go always talk about him here. Think about Melchizedek. Thank you. Thank you, Melchizedek. Because Psalm 110 says, doesn't it? You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Sit at my right hand. This is what this is all about, you know. If you want to see Yeshua right now in your, you know, imagination, unless you see him sitting down, you've got the wrong picture, because that's what he's doing right now. He is seated. Psalm 10 is the Melky Desert, but Melky Desert Psalm. Psalm 10, for your information, is the most, the most referenced, the, or quoted directly, or referenced of all of the Tanakh scriptures. It's the most referenced in the New Testament, the Psalm 10. You know, whenever you hear Paul saying that he is seated in heavenly places and you are seated in him, it's all Psalm 10. 
at the end of Yeshua's trial, when they said they couldn't get a word out of him, they put him under oath and said, we are putting you under oath now. Which means you've got to answer it, you've got to tell the truth. Just tell us plainly, are you the Messiah? And what did Yeshua say? He under oath, he went, oh well, yeah, okay, but I'll tell you something else. From now on, you're going to see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the power on high. And that's when the high priest tore his robe. Because Yeshua was announcing, I am Melchizedek. I'm the king of righteousness. I am the new high priest on the block. And it says that this priesthood is forever. So that's why the high priest tore his robe. He lost a plot. But it was a spiritual thing going on as well because tearing the high priest's robe and all the priesthood and all the priesthood and he was doing this and that's why Yeshua no one saw his robe <laughs> that's why the prophets call for it the Psalms they're going to cast lots for this robe no one's tearing that man. no one's tearing that you might be able to tear the veil in the tabernacle but you're not going to tear that robe we're going to get a gang of Romans to cast lots for it how great is our God how great is our God and how much does he want us to understand this priesthood yeah we've got to understand the Melchizedek priesthood and you don't understand that by reading Hebrews and asking the Father to open your eyes and give you understanding but it's a priesthood of being seated it's a priesthood of rest it's a priesthood of I've done the work what he's doing I've done all the work I've just sit down and rest and when I've got something for you to do I will tell you what to do and then you can go and do it because you'll just be like a shirt who said, I only do what I see the Father do. I only say what I hear him say. Yeah, and that's the priesthood we've got to be part of. But it starts at the most beautiful place of rest. And that's why we love the Sabbath so much, because it teaches us rest. That's why we love this. That's why we love bread and wine. We talk about that. Well, it. It's always pointing to Yeshua, who was going to take bread and wine at the Last Supper and say, I'm going now to prepare a place for you. <laughs> and I'll come back. And until I come back, do this in remembrance of me. It's the Melchizedek priesthood. So this is what it's saying. When he sits on his throne, right? So start thinking, Yeshua, dead, buried, resurrected, ascended to heaven, sitting on his throne in Psalm 2, laughing, it says. God looks at the nations raging and he's sitting on his throne, laughing. That's what it says. Sit. What? Oh, he's still up there. Yes. I like that. I don't understand what that's about, but I like it. Yeah. Um, so when he sits on his throne, I think it's you and I. When he sits on his throne, this is what the king must do. He shall write for himself a copy of this story in a book from the one before the priest, the Levites. And it shall be with him all, and he shall read it all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear Jehovah his Elohim and be careful to observe all the words of this law and these statutes that his heart may be not lifted up above his brethren see this is what Yeshua said to me I have not come to be saved I have come to save and if you want to be like me save each other that's what it says don't let your heart be lifted up he, he is sit, you know what so, remember Terry saying that after this, he said he should have sang that song, This is our God, the Saving King. This is our God, the Saving King. That's who Yeshua is. He's our God. And he is the King who came to save and to show us an example that this is what you must do. You know, we're talking about washing each other's feet, which is what we do here. Yeah, so we're not washing each other's feet naturally. We're doing it spiritually, aren't we? We're saying, let's get together on the Sabbath and let all those cares leave them outside. Let's spend time with our King. Let's worship Him. Let's read His Word. Let's have our feet washed from all of the dust of the week that we've had, the world that we've been in this week. Oh, let's get washed. Let's get refreshed on the Sabbath. So that's why I'm saving that. His heart may be not be lifted up above his brethren, that he may not turn aside from the commandments to the right hand or to the left, and that he may prolong his days in his kingdom. Amen, because his kingdom's everlasting. He and his children in the midst of Israel. So can you see what I'm saying? When he sits on his throne, this king has to do something. He has to write a copy of the Torah. And guess where our king's doing that? Yes. On our hearts and on our minds. 
He's doing it. He is the king seated on his throne. And because he's seated on his throne, he can, he can do the new covenant now. He doesn't need stone tablets now. That's the difference we talked a lot about last week. I just want to say it in a nutshell. If I'm, sorry if I'm going everywhere. But the Sinai Zion paradigm. Sinai. It's a paradigm shift, isn't it? That, you know, it says quite clearly, we looked at Galatians 4 last week and Hebrews 12, and Galatians 4 and Hebrews 12 was teaching us that you have not come to Sinai. You have not come to Sinai. Sinai represents bondage. That's what it says. I'm sorry, but I'm not, not even sorry. I'm made up. That's what it says in Galatians 4. Sinai represents bondage and represents this earthly Jerusalem which is in bondage with their children. However, brethren, you have come to Mount Zion which is the heavenly Jerusalem and the mother of us all. What's this mean? That what I'm saying is this is Sinai. Here is two stone tablets. Do that and don't do that or you're dead. That's Sinai. Zion's not that. Zion is you hearing yourself. That's what Sinai should have been. Sinai was a gang of people saying, no, this voice is going to kill us and Moses mentions this again tonight in chapter 18 I'll recap oh this voice will kill us you got to speak to him Moses and you come back and you tell us what he said that's Sinai that's Sinai some fella trying to tell you what to do Dumb. trying to communicate it. oh goodness of his heart trying to communicate. but it couldn't work no. it couldn't it really heart. it was it couldn't never work. ever going to succeed no. Zion is not that no. Zion's not some pastor doing it for you or some YouTube fella doing it for you Zion is you doing it for you and you hearing his voice yourself then it will be written on your own heart and then it will be written on your mind which is where we started tonight wasn't it with these gates that's the new covenant I mean there's just no that's other new covenant new than that I mean, one the new covenant is that. You know when Yeshua said to me, because he was most blessed with born again. You know you're not getting in the kingdom. What's born again mean? Look it means you get a new heart. A new heart is the new covenant. There's no other covenant outside of that. It doesn't exist. It's just man made doctrines, man made philosophies. If it's not Torah based, it's not the new covenant. You go. I mean, you've only got to read it. Read it for yourself. Jeremiah 31. Ezekiel is a 36. I'll give you a new heart. I'll write my commands. I'll write them on your heart. I'll take away your heart of stone. I'll give you a heart of flesh. And my Torah will be all over it. And that, I mean, that's the new covenant. Anything else is a blag. Anything else is deception. Anything else is not the new covenant. Else it's clear. And you can read that in the New Testament. And Hebrews chapter 8. It's quoting Jeremiah 31. And that's in the New Testament. So this is who we are. And that, thank God, because that's what the king is meant to do. <laughs> that's what it says here, isn't it? Where he sits on his throne. In other words, when he's done the work of redemption. When he shed his blood, when he's paid the price, when he's been dead for three days and three nights and rose again on the third day. And then when he's ascended to heaven and when he sits on his throne, then he can start writing the Torah on his people's hearts and on his people's minds. This is what Paul's on about in Romans 12. Be transformed. Your life will be transformed when your mind is renewed to this. I mean, that's the only way this will work. And I'm so glad that my king is doing this on my life, on my heart. You know, I think it's a sort of done deal in the spirit, if you know what I mean, the new creation. But I think it's a work in progress in our minds to the degree that we apply ourselves, meditating. It is, it is still, I'm just saying, I sort of see it that, you know, yeah. in our inner being, in our inner man, I think we are whole and complete. That's why we stand for the new creation. But the mind is a work in progress, and we need to put the work in 
but not in our own strength. You know, it's got to all be by His Spirit, as you say. But we just need to apply ourselves to this. He was invading the covenant of the house of Israel and Judah because Judah is right. the lion of Judah. That's right. And, and so we, we really are spiritually the lion. Yeah, we, we're grafted in our... We're, we're grafted into Judah. I think I agree with that. I think I do agree so with that. So that covenant is for us, Judah. Ah, it's totally for us. As it's, that's what I'm saying, if you're not grafted in, you're not saved. <laughs> you're grafted in, you're still the enemy. It's the lion of Judah. Oh yeah, I get that. Like. Yeah, so this is this king we're talking about. This king, this righteous king, who will judge right this king, this right the Tory. And he's right doing it right. on hearts of flesh. Yeah. Not on stab tongues, stone tablets anymore. This is a better priesthood, better covenant, and he's doing it on our hearts. Amen. But that is the only covenant you've got. You know, you've got. I haven't got any other options. Like. So, chapter 18 now. Still got half an hour, haven't we? So we're doing all right. And I'm saying I'm not going to read maybe into the text, I don't think, because I want to just, is that all right? Just put it into the context of Yeshua. Really? You know, you can read it all yourself, I hope you do. Chapter 18 is about the priests. We've said loads about the priesthood over the, year, over the years, yeah. So I'm not going to spend time on the priesthood so much. There's probably things I want to pick out here, but just let's crack on. Let's get to the favourite bit, my one of the favourite scriptures. And this is so important. Already mentioned it. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15. This is so important. Yahweh, your Elohim, will raise up for you a prophet like me from the midst of your brethren. Him you shall shma. Him, you better pay attention to what he's going to say. You need to listen to the prophet that Yah will raise up like me. Some of the Jews say that this is talking about Joshua. Some, some Jews disagree vehemently and say it's not about Joshua, not that they believe in our Messiah, Yeshua, but some Jews differ over who this is. Some think it's still got to come. Some say it was Joshua. The, the Islam will tell you it's Muhammad. Well, we'll see what the Bible says. Verse 16, according to Yah, this is what I mentioned before, according to all you desired of Yah and your Elohim in Horeb in the day of the assembly, saying, let me not hear again, this is what he said, let me not hear again the voice of Yah. Imagine saying that. Oh, that's why Psalm 95 and Hebrews 3 and 4 keep reiterating Psalm 95. Today, if you hear his voice, don't be like them. Don't be like them. Do not be like them. If you hear his voice, don't be bad. This is that month of return now. Let's return to him. So they said to Horeb, Don't let me not hear again the voice of Yahuwah, my Elohim, nor let me see this great fire anymore, lest I die. And Yah said to me, What they have spoken is good. But if you remember, going back to Deuteronomy, you've got to read the next verse after that. God said, Oh, that they had such a heart in them. Remember, we read it the other week in Deuteronomy. I'll just give you the reference. Deuteronomy 6, was it? 5? Five? 5. Deuteronomy 5, verse 29. Oh, that they had such a heart in them, that they will fear me always, keep all my commandments, that I might be well with them and with their children forever. Lay all hand by head. Right? See what I'm saying? This is what God said. Oh, that they had such a heart in them. He was speaking about the new covenant even then. Even then he was going, the only way this is going to work is with new hearts. This isn't going to work with tablets of stone. Because they'd given them the commandments, hadn't he? They'd had a book. He wrote it in a book, Moses. And they sprinkled it with blood. And they had a meal. And Moshe went up the mountain and left them for 40 days. And when he comes down, they made a golden calf. And God's like, I know this isn't going to work. <laughs> they wouldn't hear my voice. I wanted to do a wonderful work in them. Oh, that they had such a heart in them. But it was always pointing to the fact that we will get new hearts in the new covenant. Does that make sense? No? <laughs> Verse 17, uh, 18. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brethren. And will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. Does this sound familiar? Well, it will do when we start going to the Gospels in a minute. 
Well, I'll just finish off this passage. And it shall be, verse 19, that whoever will not hear my words which he speaks in my name, I will require it of him. It's what Yah's saying. I'm going to send a prophet that's going to speak my words. And whoever won't listen to that prophet, they'll have me to deal with. Is that fair? Well, I hope so. That's what God's saying. Verse 9, 20. But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. This is why they were always trying to stone Yeshua, because they thought he was a false prophet, didn't he? And if you say in your heart, how shall we know the words which Yahovah has not spoken? This I will know. When a prophet speaks in the name of Yehovah, if the thing does not happen or come to pass, that is the thing which Yahovah has not spoken. That's clear, isn't it? If someone prophesies something and it doesn't happen, they're a false prophet. And I'm telling you, there's a load of them getting away with it. And still in ministry. And still coining it in. And still on God's television. And they're clearly and still false prophets because they prophesied things that did not happen. Why would you tolerate these people? Why would you tolerate a false prophet? What charm have these people got that they can get away with blatant false prophecy? It's an, it's an embarrassment, isn't it? It's an indictment to the household of God that there's false prophets running amok well, and flying around on players. What? That's probably the answer, Silver. That's probably the answer, thank you, because that's the answer. Yeah, amen. Yeah. Right, so let's just go back then. I want to go into the Gospels now. And you know, you may know all this, probably you see what doing all this, but I just want to proclaim it. So what have we looked at so far? We've looked at the judge. Well, we finished with that bit, really, because that's to come, isn't it? That's Revelation 19. Yeshua said in his first time, I haven't come to judge. I don't think I've come to judge yet. Yes, You've got someone who judges yet. Moses, <laughs> what are you up? That's going to judge yet. I haven't come to judge yet. That's what he said the first time. So now we're looking at the king and we're looking at the prophet. So I want to just go through the gospels and comment on things as we go. So we'll start where we should always start when we start the gospels, John. <laughs> it might be the last one of the four, but it's the first one. <laughs> you know, you want to, when we do the gospels chronologically, you'll be amazed and watch with it, John, before we even get started in the other gospels. Because the gospel starts with John. John chapter one, and I'll just give you a little heads up now on it. John chapter 1, just so you can do this yourself, anyone who John chapter one. the Gospels. You know, you'll see Matthew, Mark and Luke, they all take you into the wilderness. They all do the baptism when Yeshua gets baptised and the dove comes and the voice speaks. And then Yeshua goes into the wilderness for 40 days and they cover all that. And they cover right up to the temptation when Satan tempts them. Yeah, they cover all that. But they don't come out to the wilderness the next day. John covers that. You'll see this more clearly in the Gospels. John. But that's this part now. John 1, verse 29. Well, no, we've got to go. Sorry. John 1, verse... Where should we go? Sorry. Verse 19. Let me just read the Gospels. All right? 20 minutes, and I'm just going... Is that all right? I just want to go through nice, easy, just quoting the Scriptures, just to reinforce that everything we've read tonight is completely utterly about Yeshua. Here's the prophet... And he is the king. He is also the judge. And as we've seen, he is the man of war. He's also the <laughs> and he is definitely the high priest. So chapter 1 of John, verse 19. Definitely. Now this is the testimony of John, Yochanan. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? He confessed and he did not deny, but confessed and he said, I am not the Messiah. They asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? Eliyahu, are you Eli Eliyahu? Eli, my God, my God is Yah. God. That's what my Eliyahu God. means. Elijah, my God is Yah. Are you Eliyahu? He said, I am not. Are you Eli Are you the prophet? Not are you any our prophet. Are you the prophet? See, they were expecting the prophet because they were. Torah believers and they knew Moses that said a prophet's gonna come like me so that's why they're saying to John are you the prophet 
And he answered, No. Then they said to him, Who are you that we may give an answer to those who sent us? What do you say about yourself? He said, I'm the voice of one crying in the wilderness. I'm Isaiah 40 in action. Make straight the way of Jehovah, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now those who were sent were from the Pharisees, and they asked him, saying, no, Why do you baptize if you are not the, the Messiah, nor Eliyahu, nor the prophet? Uh, when I was reading that this week, I thought, isn't that interesting on the Mount of Transfiguration? Yeshua's there, the Messiah. Eliyahu's there, and the prophet is there, Moshe. They're all there, and that's who these are asking. Are you Elijah? Are you the prophet? Are you the Messiah? It's like that, are you, you know, that special group of three fellas. You know, Yeshua, Moses, and Elijah. They all done a 40 day fast, so maybe if you do a 40 day fast, you'll get invited to one of their meetings. <laughs> <laughs> Verse 26, Yeshua answered them saying, John answered them saying, I baptize with water, but there is one standing among you whom you do not know. It is he who coming after me is prepared before me, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to loose. These things were done in Beta Barre, beyond the Jordan, where John was baptizing. I'm just going to carry on. Verse 29, the next day, Yochanan, John saw Yeshua coming towards him. When we make sense of this, you'll see that this is when Yeshua comes out of the wilderness. He's been in the wilderness for 40 days and nights. Matthew, Mark, and Luke cover that. Now John brings you out of the wilderness the next day. The next day, Yochanan saw Yeshua coming towards him and he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is him who I said after me comes a man who is prepared before me. But he was before me. I didn't know him. But that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore I came baptized with water. And Yochanan bore witness saying, I mean, you've got to bear in mind, this is the Jews have been sent from Jerusalem to ask him, and this is his testimony. It's like, you want to know what I'm doing here? Well, this is my testimony. Go and tell the people in Jerusalem that I've asked. So then people in Jerusalem had no excuse. No excuse. That's why Yeshua will say, just before they crucify him, whose baptism is John? Is that from God or from man? Because he knew. If they say from man, the, the crowd will lynch him, because they love John. And if they say from God, then you already hear from John who I am, because this is John's testimony. Verse 30, 33, 32, I saw the Spirit descended from heaven like a dove, and he remains upon us. I didn't know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, upon whom you see the Son, the Spirit descending and remaining on him. This is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. So go and tell them people in Jerusalem, I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. It's like, it's quite clear, John's testimony, isn't it? Verse 35, again the next day. Again the next day, John stood with two of his disciples and looking at Yeshua. As he walked, he said, Behold the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him speak as they followed Yeshua. Then Yeshua turned and seeing them follow and said to them, What do you seek? They said to him, Rabbi, which is to say, when translated, teacher, where are you when staying? He said to them, Come and see. Then they came and saw where he was staying and remained with him that day. Verse 40. Now one of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon, Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated to Christ. And he brought him to Yeshua. Now when Yeshua looked at him, now again I'll just give you another little heads up here for the Gospels. I love this when Anne said it, when we were doing the Gospels with Anne, and she said, I have wondered for 30 years, why would fellas in a fishing boat just follow some fella because he said, come follow me. When you put it all together, you start to realise when Matthew, Mark and Luke are recording, the disciples getting called, they've already met. <laughs> they've already met already they're not just sitting in boats and it's just some fella with a white thing on and a beard going follow me and they're going I don't know who he is but come on then that's not what happens they already know him this is where he first meets here he first found his own son verse 42 and he brought him to Yeshua found. and when Yeshua looked at him he said you are Simon the son of Jonah you, you shall be called Cephas 
which is translated as a stone. This is when Yeshua finished that piece and he changed his name. <laughs> so when they're on boats in Luke, Matthew and Mark, <laughs> so they've already met. Them. Somehow, they've stopped following, which warmed my heart when I realised that. Because I stopped following Yeshua. I followed him for years and then shipped him and got off and thought I was great. And he came back for me, just the way he came back for these other disciples. They'd gone back to their fishing businesses. Yeshua came back again. And when he says, come and follow me, this is when he first met. So we're doing the Gospels, six weeks at a time here. But whatever. I didn't mean to read all this bit, but I want to just stay in it. You know, that's all right. We're getting to the point now. Verse 43, the following day. See how quick this is. First day, the second day, the following day. Yeshua wanted to go to Galilee and he found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathaniel and said to him, we have found him of whom Moshe in the law and also the prophets wrote, Yeshua, the Nazareth of Nazareth, the let's say. Philip said to him, come and see. Yeshua saw Nathaniel coming to him and said, behold an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathaniel said to him, How do you know me? Nathaniel said, Yeshua answered and said to him, Before Philip called you, you were under the fig tree. Before Philip called you and you were under the fig tree, I saw you. This is the point. Nathaniel answered and said to him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. So this is the start of the Gospels now. And already Yeshua is getting identified. This is the King of Israel. This is the King of Israel. Let's stay in John and go to John 6 now. This is the feeding of the 5,000. This is after Yeshua has fed the 5,000. Verse 13, John 6. Therefore they gathered themselves, gathered them up and filled 12 baskets. 12 baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves which were left over by those who had eaten. Then those men, when they had seen the sign that Yeshua did, said, when they, this is truly the prophet. Well, our prophet, the prophet, the Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15 prophet, the one Moshe said was to come into the world. This is the prophet. Look at the next one. Therefore, when Yeshua perceived that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, <laughs> He departed again into the mountain by himself alone. The next thing he's about to do is walk on the water. But we'll leave that until we get to the gospel. So already in John, you've been introduced now. This is the king of Israel. Now the crowds are recognising this is the prophet. And they were going to take him by force to make him king. Because they're all, this is the king. This is the king. And this is the prophet that Moses told us to. They, they put this together. They know this is all talking about the one man, this righteous judge who will be the king, the prophet and the priest who's going to make war very soon. Let's just stay with John, I think. Let's stay with John and go to chapter 7. So we've just been in John 6, now we're in John 7. You don't know where John 7 is. John 7 is tabernacles, isn't it? John 7 is tabernacles when Yeshua stood up. On the last great day of the feast, and he said, Whoever is thirsty, let him come to me, and out of his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Well, he just said that, and then in John 7, verse 40, Therefore, many from the crowd, when they heard this yeah. saying, said, Truly, this is the prophet. I mean, you just keep seeing it, don't you? Everyone's saying, This is the prophet. This is the prophet. This is the prophet. This is the king. Let's just do a few more. John 12 now. John 12 is Passover. 12. John 12 is Passover. When Yeshua enters on a donkey triumphantly. It's not Palm Sunday. It's actually the Sabbath. But he enters anyway, Jerusalem. And in verse 13, it says that to chapter 12, John, John 12, 13, that the people took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him and cried what we cry every week. Oh, Shiana, please save. Blessed is he 
who comes in the name of Yehovah, the King of Israel. This is the whole of Jerusalem now. They are recognizing who this is. This is the King of Israel. This is who this is. The King of Israel. And now finally, well it's not finally, let me just do one more from let me just quickly mention this one from Matthew. You don't have to go there. Matthew 21 is recorded the same event. It's recorded the triumphal entry. It's recorded the triumphal entry. Matthew 21 and verse 10 it says, When he came into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? Who is this? So the multitude said, This is Yeshua. So the multitude said, This is Yeshua, the prophet. I mean, it's established, isn't it? This is who he is. He is the prophet of Nazareth from of Galilee. I've already mentioned the final. You can read it in most of the Gospels. But when Yeshua was crucified, just before he was crucified, Pilate asked him, are you a king? And Yeshua had to say to Pilate, yes, I am king. Not the way you say it. My kingdom's different. And they crucified him. And that was the thing they put above his head, wasn't it? This is Yeshua of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. So all I'm doing all this for is to make clear from the scriptures, from our scriptures, that Yeshua is the prophet, the prophet and the king. So let's just hear what the prophet says about all of this. Back in John, back in John, chapter 12 again. Because what did the Torah say? You'll keep on seeing this in John, John 12 again. You keep on seeing this throughout John. You see it a lot in John 5. When he's sure saying all the time, I have not come with my own doctrine. I have not come to start a new religion called Christianity. That's going to change all the Torah. Ah, that's not me. That's going to change. Got the wrong fella if you think that's who I am. That's what you're sure saying. You've got this Yeshua, this Jesus that's changed the Torah. Now, what's the fellow we were talking about last week from the Roman Catholic Church? It's not the real Yeshua. The real Yeshua has not come to say anything of himself. That's what he said. He said, The only things I say is what I hear the Father say. So let's just clarify this now from John 12. We've already been in John 12. This is. When well, she was at it, John 12. John 12, and just to finish off, we'll read from verse 44. Then Yeshua cried out and said, He who believes in me, Yeshua, believes not in me, but in him who sent me. That's what's really important here. The one who sent me. And he who sees me, sees him who sent me. That's what Yeshua said at the last supper, wasn't it? In a couple of chapters. That's what Philip, Philip, have I been with you so long? And you don't realise this. You've seen me. You've seen the Father. I and the Father are one. I have come as a light into the world. That whoever believes in me should not abide in darkness. And if anyone hears my words and does not believe. That's what we read in the Torah, wasn't it? It's we read does not believe. I'll put my words in his mouth. And it shall be, whoever will not hear my words, which he speaks in my name, I will require it of him. What's Yeshua saying? If anyone hears my words and doesn't believe, I don't judge him. I didn't come to judge the world, but to save the world. He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The words which I have spoken will judge him in the last day. For I have not spoken on my own authority. But the Father who sent me, Deuteronomy 18, who sent gave me a command, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his command is everlasting life. Therefore, whenever I speak, just as the Father has told me, so I speak. And that's very clear, I think, that Yeshua is making clear that he is doing exactly what the Torah required of him. To come and just speak the words that God told me. Obedience. Obedience, yeah. And last year, I, I, I thanked you last year, George, for reminding us of this. John 5. I thanked you for reminding me because you interjected last year to remind us of what Yeshua said. 
in John chapter 5. John chapter 5, he says this. Verse 30, he says this. Uh, let's read from verse 37. The Father himself who sent me. The same language all the time, Yeshua. The Father who sent me. The Father who sent me has testified of me. You've neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his form, but you do not have the words abiding in you, because whom he sent, him you do not believe. Because you search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me. But you are not willing to come to me, that you may have life. But you are not I do not receive honour from men, but I know you, that you do not have the love of God in you. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, him you will receive. This is talking about this end time deception. Someone's going to come in his own name, saying he's God. Verse 44, how can you believe you receive honour from one another, and don't seek the honour that comes from the only God? Verse 45, do not think that I shall accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, in whom you believe. For if you believe Moses, you would believe me, because he wrote about me. But if you don't believe his writings, how would you believe my words? Because he's only saying what Moses said. Final words on this is Matthew 23, and this is when you reminded me last year to read John 5. Because Matthew 23, I love making this point, so I'm finishing with this. Matthew chapter 23. Yeshua just said, hasn't he? If you don't believe what Moses wrote, how are you going to believe me? And that applies to people that think Moses is irrelevant anymore. Well, who are they really believing in? Because that's what Yeshua is saying. Don't argue with me. It's what Yeshua is saying. Argue with him. And please do. Because he can deal with it. He says that's reason together. You know, you've got a problem with this Torah. Argue with him about it. Talk to him about it. Please. Matthew 23. Is Yeshua's final words publicly. It's his last words publicly. He's going to be having private conversations after this on the Mount of Olives with four of his disciples and with his disciples at the Last Supper. Private. This is his last words publicly. There's chapter 23. Then Yeshua spoke to the multitudes and to his disciples Yeshua, saying, this is so important, the scribes and the Pharisees so sit in Moses' seat. Now all of your translations says this, Therefore, whatever they tell you to do, right? Now, if you are a Christian here, if you are a believer in the Messiah, you really need to listen to this. You really need to hear what Yeshua is saying. So these are his last words, and now he's telling you what you as a believer must do. Therefore, whatever they tell you to do, observe that and do it. That's what Yeshua, if that's what Yeshua is saying, right? I want to see all the fellas in here next week with skull caps on. And I don't want to see anyone putting the right shoe on in the morning first. Because you've got to put your left shoe on first. Then you can put your right shoe on. But don't tie that. Tie the other one first. Because that's what the rabbi say you've got to do. That's what they say you've got to do. You've got to put your shoes on in a certain way. If that's what Yeshua is telling us to do, we've got problems like we better start get, getting to the synagogue and bowing down and doing what the rabbis say. But the great news here is that's not what Yeshua said. In the Hebrew Matthew, it doesn't say that at all. It's only one word, difference. But it says, Yeshua says that the Pharisees and the scribes sit in Moses' seat. Therefore, whatever he says, not what they say, not what they say, they've got a man-made religion. They're about to kill him because he keeps breaking their man-made religion and rebuking them for their man-made religion. Yeshua's not advocating a man-made religion, saying you've got to do what the Pharisees say. No, he's saying, look, they've had Moses' seat off. They're squatting in Moses' seat. 
They're coming across that they've got the authority of Moses. But they haven't got the authority of Moses. Moses. It's a man-made religion. They're blagging you. Do not do what they say you say. Do what Moses says. And this fits in perfectly with Deuteronomy chapter 18, where Moses says, God is going to raise up for you a prophet like me. He's going to be like me. You know, we just say he's going to look like me, but he's going to be like me. He's going to sound like me. But he's going to say the things that I said. It's exactly what Yeshua said, isn't it? If you don't believe what Moses wrote, how are you going to believe what I said? Church, Jews, the whole wide world. You don't believe what Moses wrote. You think it's all I've got away with. You will end up with some figments of your own imagination of some fellow that was born on Christmas Day coming around with Easter eggs. That is the faith that you will go to. That is not the Messiah. That is it's just not. So I'm not going to say much more because I've nearly, well, I've gone over two minutes anyway. Father, I just pray that all this will do tonight is make us here realise who Yeshua really is. That he is the King of Kings who is coming to judge the world with righteousness and he won't take a bribe. He's going to judge with complete lots of righteousness, exactly according to how Moses has written it. I thank you, Lord, that you've taken the death penalty upon yourself and that all of the cases you took upon yourself for those that repent, for those that confess and make you the Lord, you've took our penalty of death upon yourself. Thank you for that, Lord. Thank you for taking that penalty upon us, upon you. But none of us here want a license to sin. Lord, we want you to empower us by your Holy Spirit to help us to be a holy people, the people that were called to be. Like we started off as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So help us, Lord, to see us the way you see us, so that we can start to act accordingly and start to walk accordingly and start to walk with all of the authority that you start you put within us, Lord, in this day. With all the authority in Yeshua's name. Father, thank you for this group, Lord. Just open the eyes of everyone here so that we start to understand our Messiah and start to walk in the faith that you've called us to. As that guy from America who's coming in a few weeks says, Romans teaches a faith that leads to obedience. And that's what we want to be, an obedient people. So I'll just say the a blessing. Yivarechecha, Yehovah, Vaishmerecha, Yair, Yehovah, Panavelecha, Veichurecha, Yisa, Yehovah, Panavelecha, Shalom. Yahovah bless you and keep you. Yahovah make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. And Yahovah lift up his countenance upon you and give you shalom. All this Shabbat and through this coming week. Lord, be gracious to us all. Let the love of God, the love of God. Oh, the grace of Yeshua and our Messiah oh, the and the fellowship of His Holy Spirit and be mightily with us all this week. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Thanks for coming. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom.